Yeah, very well said. And in terms of that, you know, stickier or sludgier blood for the listener, if you know those platelet aggregation it's is increasing, it's thicker. Literally, the blood does get thicker and flows more slowly. In fact, in response to stress and and smoking and active and and being sedentary and being obese. Absolutely, and I've heard you mention in your talks those factors, those lifestyle factors. You mentioned, you know, smoking, high blood sugars, obesity, stress, hypertension, familial hypercholesterolemia, inflammation, and advanced age. Obviously, being um, places for people to start, and those lifestyle factors being kind of the big rocks. Would that be a, right. you know, your your opinion still on how to how to tackle this stuff? And you know, it's not such a big. Well, well, I tell you, the real problem. I can say it's not a big deal, but the real problem is that. People who who smoke and are overweight and they're eating a crappy diet, they're going to their doctor to take a pill to be able to reverse this unhealthy lifestyle. And I think that whole attitude needs to change. Um, you don't have to work out. You know, I was actually working out five days a week. I was killing myself because I thought that was the way I was going to lower my triglycerides. I think people need to understand that first of all, I mean, if you smoke, forget it. There is a, there's no pill that's going to reverse the hazards caused by smoking. So you just simply have to stop that. Um, and I see obese people, and I just feel so sorry for them because I see them having diet food. I see them having you know, low-fat food, and they've just been poorly educated um, to not know what it is they need to eat to be able to lose the weight. And so subtle changes in a person's life can have such a dramatic difference. Just getting out and being active, not smoking, controlling stress, Reducing the amount of bread, potatoes, and sugar in your diet and enjoying food high in protein and fat. I mean, go out and enjoy a steak. Just don't have the potato. I mean, how hard is that to do? That's the way I look at a lifestyle change. For sure. And it's definitely something that uh, working downtown Toronto, I work a lot in men's health. And a lot, you know, a lot of guys between the age of 35 and 75 who are in a situation where they are potentially at higher risk and, you know, Low carbs definitely been an effective nutritional strategy to help to achieve a lot of this stuff, and the, you know, the that caloric restriction that you mentioned before, which is a key part of this as well, happens naturally on a, you know, a low carb diet because you're excluding all those, uh, you know, the majority of the processed foods that folks eat. You get more vegetables, you get more protein, you do get the natural fats that people are eating in in foods. So it's it can be a you know a great strategy. Now, for some folks listening in, they might say, well. You, potentially you could accomplish this with a, a low-fat diet if they were in a caloric deficit. Um, is that something that you would agree with if the person was able to maintain it, which I think sometimes is harder in, in practice no. than in theory, but uh, what are your thoughts there? No, I think that's completely the wrong kind of thinking. The goal is not a caloric deficit. The goal is not to lose weight. The goal is to be healthy. I mean, the first thing that is so important is to understand when there is fat in the meal you absorb nutrients more efficiently. I mean, there's so many studies, first of all, that show that. When there is fat and protein in the meal, you feel full. You naturally have negative feedback. You naturally feel full, so you will consume fewer calories. You don't even have to count calories. That's what's really important about the low-carb diet. The only thing you're keeping track of is carbs. And I'm, since I have a carb budget that I allow myself each day, I do count carbs and I try to stay below 50 grams of carbs per day. I don't have to count calories uh, uh, to be able to maintain good weight and, in fact, to be able to lose weight. So the first thing is weight loss is not the goal. Healthy living is the goal. And the way to be healthy is to have natural sources of protein and fat. So that, that's really the first point. Uh, and in fact, the real problem is when you have people that go low calorie, especially low fat, they will lose weight. But what's happening is they've now got insulin receptors that have gotten more sensitive. And as soon as those people reach their target weight and they want to celebrate, um, it doesn't take long then to be able to have that increased insulin sensitivity, which is now going to dramatically increase fat deposition as soon as they start eating more carbs. And so I, what I emphasize to people is low carb is not a dieting approach to lose weight. Low carb is simply something that is natural. It's what we evolved to do. It's a lifestyle choice. It's, it, it's something you do for your entire life. You don't do it to reach a target goal. And let me, let me just add something, by the way. You, you, we had talked about familial hypercholesterolemia earlier. For sure. Um, and we did just publish a paper. I think it's very important for people to understand. You have about one in every 400 people is diagnosed with this, and they've been frightened into taking statins. 
and of course, we're going to be careful here. I'm not um, giving any medical advice, but I am giving information. Um, only a subset of people with FH actually develop heart disease. And so the question is, why did these people with their LDL being 250 develop heart disease when other people with FH with their LDL at 250 do not develop heart disease? And the difference again gets back to clotting factors. Fibrinogen is one. The people who have extremely high LDL and clotting factors are the ones who develop the heart disease. So again, what you want to do is keep those clotting factors low and keep them calm. And so the people with FH who also smoke are the ones that have extremely high rates of heart disease. Or those who have diabetes, very high rate of heart disease. So the most important thing for a person with FH to do is to be able to be sure that they have low blood sugar, that they exercise to control their stress. And if they do that, they've dramatically reduced their risk of developing heart disease. David, that's a fantastic, terrific insights here today and definitely want to respect your time. So before we wrap up, a, f a final few questions for you. Um, mm -hmm. The first one is, you know, you're now lecturing to cardiologists, you're writing in cardiology journals. Um, you know, what's the evolution of research in this space? Oh, wow. Um, you know, it's a great question. And I, I'm not a pessimistic person by nature, but it's very frustrating because I still see a dominance in the field of pharma-supported researchers. I see a dominance by the American Heart Association, which is to a great extent supported by food and drug companies. Um, so the control still in this, in this field is by those who have perpetuated the fear of cholesterol. And when you've got at least 25% of older uh, adult Americans now taking a statin, and they're projecting that it'll be as much as half of all adults on statins, uh, it's hard to be optimistic. But um, my colleagues and I are getting the papers out there. We have opportunities to lecture. I see low-carb um, diet now be becoming promoted more by medical establishment. So I'd like to be optimistic right now, cautiously optimistic, that low-carb is, is really becoming much more commonly accepted with the caveat that people fear that when they're on low carb, if their LDL goes up, then they'll go on a statin. So while both I'm optimistic about low carb being accepted, I'm still concerned that we're not able to get the information out there about LDL uh, in any way, shape, or form causing heart disease. But that's my goal for the future is to get these papers out there on the real science. And that sort of dovetails into my last question, which is, you know, for yourself as a career scientist, you know, how can getting back to some of these sound scientific principles in, in this space help to elucidate some of these answers that we need to get to? Well, fortunately, um, I'm in academics, um, you know, and I'm in a position to be able to publish in medical journals. I have some credibility because I'm a professor at a university and I got a PhD in biology. So that sort of gets me uh, in through the door to be able to have um, sufficient credibility and background to be able to share this information. And I've been working with just an outstanding group of MDs and PhDs. And I really want to give credit to Ufi Ravenskov, who's been providing this message now for decades. Uh, and I depended on him heavily when I was learning um, about a, sense, a lot of the problems with cholesterol. And, and there are just so many others. I'm reluctant to mention anyone because I know I would leave out people who are influential in this field. But the important, the important thing is that um, we've got a lot of really good MDs and PhDs who have been alerted to the deception in this field, and they're getting the information out there, working with Michelle DeLargeril, Paul Roche, and Malcolm Kendrick, and, and they're just such great MDs that I'm working with that, that I believe in time we're going to be able to get that information out there to be able to influence people. David, fantastic. Really appreciate you, again, taking the time today. And, you know, where can people stay connected with you and keep up with all your fantastic work and research? Um, well, I don't, um, you know, I don't have a book. I don't have a website. I'm not, I'm not promoting anything. Um, I'm really just in a position where I want to share information, so I have absolutely no conflict of interest. Um, and I do have people who contact me directly at my university site. So, uh, Anyone's welcome to go to my site, the Department of Psychology at University of South Florida. Um, I don't give any medical advice. I do get a lot of people who contact me and ask me what they should do. And I always say there's, there's really nothing I can do. I can uh, they'll give them information. So I'm available by email. I'm on Twitter 
my username is LDL Skeptic. <laughs> Perfect. Um, and so that's really perhaps the best place to, to be sharing information and to be learning um, about um, what I've been publishing and my views on cholesterol and, and uh, diet. Thank you.